Let me start with this question of Pakistanis in America. And uh, Rajasa, simply because you asked those questions, I have these magical slides to at least give you my answer <laughs> to, 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 to what the questions, uh, what the answers are. I spent a lot of time trying to figure out this community. And here are some of the things that at least the most interesting Pakistanis came before there was a Pakistan. We, we may not realize this, but the first person born in Pakistan elected to the US Congress was elected in 1948. Was elected in 1948. He was a Hindu born in uh, Hyderabad in what was then British India, who actually became the first South Asian to serve, uh, serve uh, three terms, six years, uh, in Congress. So there is a very, very large uh, history. Does anyone know who? was born, who, which Pakistani had lead roles in 34 Hollywood movies? 34 Hollywood movies. And, and a Congressional Medal of Valor. So Thandrai in age. Not so Thandrai, but it starts with an S. Someone called Sabu Dastagir. Sabu Dastagir, uh, if you have ever seen a black and white movie with Tarzan Wali Jyoti thi, the guy who was who was in those in those black and white movies was someone called Sabu Dastagir. Sabu Dastagir was U.S. citizen of Pakistani origin number nine. This goes way back. So I'm not going to go too much into history, but I did want to point out that this is not a new endeavor, and and that that is somewhat important. Uh, the, the story of Pakistanis in America, and I'm not going to go. All, all into it. Uh, when we did our book, which was in um, 2006, published in 2006, our estimates for 2004 were, and these were very conservative estimates, uh, was that there were about half a million Pakistanis. A few years before that, uh, Sadiq Saab at the Pakistan Embassy had done some really good work estimating 480,000. Ours was more conservative. 500,000 Pakistanis in America, uh, which meant uh, included those of Pakistani origin like myself born in Pakistan, plus those born in the US of Pakistani parents. So not third generation, but first and second generation. Now, many in the community, and I met some of you when we were doing this research, tend to believe that there are more than that. Because we spend so much time with each other, we only eat with each other, and we go to mosque with each other, we all have a sense that there are far more. I remember going to Houston and the Houston community saying that there were two million Pakistanis in Houston, uh, just because they looked that many. But that was the number. My estimate now, uh, if, if, if I could have the estimate is, uh, it's been about 12 years, but I think at most aggressive estimate would be that we would be I would be very surprised, I would not be surprised if we find that there are a million Pakistanis in America. I would be very surprised if we find that there are any more than that. Uh, but that is a very significant number. That is a very significant number. It is spread all across the US. Th this is to, to talk about the strength of what this community is, but also the challenges of what this community is. Big communities also have big challenges. Uh, this is a story of how we came. And this is why in 12 years we would have doubled. Because if you look at that graph, the bulk of us really came in the last few years. And if you look at the story, uh, the first two Pakistanis who were naturalized were in 1948. In 1948, only two were naturalized. Uh, then in the 1960s, uh, 51 to 64, about 1,600 Pakistanis became uh, US residents or citizens, mostly as relations began uh, uh, growing between the two countries. This will become important in just a minute. Give me just a second to be a professor. In 65, the US uh, Immigration and Nationalization Act was passed, and then there was a steady, steady flow. This, this was the wave of knowledge Pakistanis. Some came on agricultural visas, a lot came to study, but this was the first wave. I suspect that there would be people in this room who would have come in that. The real thrust came between 1987 and 2001. This was Ronald Reagan, this was technology, this was the visa lottery, this was globalization, ease of travel, and so on and so forth. Right? I assume that most of you here uh, who came from Pakistan came in this period. Of course, then there was 2001. The mood changed after 9-11, but actually the immigration numbers after a brief dip did not change. 
they kept stabilized at about 12,000, 12, 14,000 naturalized per year. And again, I'm sorry for giving a lecture, but this will become important in just a minute. So where do these Pakistanis live? Right? So where do these Pakistanis live? Uh, and what we found is that they live all across the country. There are Pakistanis in each of the 50 states of America, including in Alaska. Why a Pakistani would go from Gujarat to Alaska, I don't know. <laughs> but, but according to my research, there are 32 Pakistanis who live in Alaska. Uh, maybe, maybe they like Sarah Pal. Uh, these, 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 these are the states that have. Now, this is the map from 2004. So, as I said, my estimate is that all these numbers you can double now. Right? But at that point, these are the states that had about 1,000 Pakistanis. Why is this important? If you're 1,000 Pakistanis in such a large state, it's very difficult to organize. If you're 1,000 Pakistanis, doing this event is not possible. Right? So for the bulk of the states, these states that you see here, mo much of the Midwest, it's 1,000 Pakistanis or less in 2006. I would say about 2,000 Pakistanis now. These are the states in which we est I estimated that we had between 1,000 and 5,000. Uh, Pakistan is living. Now, if you look at that, the map has already grown into most of the US. Right? So if you're really talking about influencing politics, national politics is not going to be influenced in that type of election. And I'll come to that in a, in, a, in a minute. Then you get a certain number of states. Now, these, these turquoise blue ones are 5,000 to 10,000. So this is Pennsylvania. This is Massachusetts, where I live. Uh, this is uh, North Carolina. Uh, and there you have at that time 10, 5 to 10,000, I would estimate now 10 to 20,000. The bigger states you start getting, they're all on the eastern half of the country. These are states, uh, Michigan, Florida, uh, and a lot around DC. A lot around DC because they are spread in three states, just like in, in this area, they're spread across to New York and New Jersey. These are 10 to 25,000. So that means now maybe touching 50,000 in some of that. Other big states, Illinois because of Chicago, Virginia because of DC, 25 to 50,000. And then, of course, the two big states here, 50,000 to 75,000 Pakistanis in Texas and in California. In both places, they are pretty, pretty dispersed. Of course, the pride of order in terms of just numbers goes to uh, where all of you are coming from, these two states up here of New York and New Jersey, which at that point we estimated were both around 90,000. So this is the greater New York area. At this point, I would estimate that that number would be around three, 350,000. <laughs> 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 But the point is that there are Pakistanis all across. There are pockets where you can do the demography of politics and figure out where you can win. In recent times, the first major elected office by a Pakistani was actually in New Hampshire. Part of that is about electoral roles. The New Hampshire State Parliament, uh, State Assembly has, is a very small state with a very large number of members. So you kind of can win a seat by winning votes in just the hundreds. But you have to know the, know the system. Here is the important thing. Now I'm, now I'm coming and, and I don't want to take too long, but I really want your attention on this because you're not going to like what I'm about to say. Here is what we found. A third of Pakistanis in America came to America since 1998. Can I ask people who came from Pakistan, who were born in Pakistan, who are in this room? Raise your hand. Okay, so most, of, many of you. Can I now ask how many of you who raised your hand came, moved to the US after 1998? Very few hands. After 1998, right? What that means is that what you think of the community may not be the community. Of these third, one third of Pakistanis in America, half of them, which means one sixth of Pakistanis in America, came to the US after 9-11. There is a demographic shift. This thing about young people is not just Narabazi. That's the community. 
our understanding of the community as us is no longer statistically true. Because a lot of them are young people who are still struggling with small children, trying to find jobs, making sure that they can get a house over their uh, head and so on and so forth. So this is different. Here is the other important point that we shouldn't forget. Half, by our estimate, of Pakistanis in America, half of Pakistanis in America were not born in Pakistan. Half of Pakistanis in America were born in the US. What does that mean? For them, many of these people who are sitting at the back of this room, these young people, the notion of Pakistan is a different one. The notion of identity is a different one. They have been hearing stories of you from you about what Pakistan is. These are very bright young people. They have figured out that some of those stories are lies. <laughs> I'm sorry. I had a student, this bright young woman, loved Pakistan, born here. She worked with me to get an internship to work in Pakistan. I got her to work, Nasreen was alive then, in Urangi in Pakistan. She came back totally dejected. I said, what happened? She said, all my life my parents kept saying, in Pakistan, bado ki badi izzat hoti hai. Tum log bado ki izzat koi nikat hai. Pakistan mein bado ki badi izzat hoti hai. Elders are respected. I went to Pakistan and no one respects elders. So these are bright kids. But they are going to listen to what you say and then they're going to test it to the real world and they're going to create an identity, part of which is going to be Pakistani American, but a lot of it is going to be lots of other things. They're not going to be interested in PPP and PML. They're going to be interested in their life and how their identity molds their life. So we need to be very cognizant of this different type of generational shift uh, that is happening here. So as I start wrapping up, uh, we are proud of being Pakistani. I certainly am, and I, I, this, the vibe in this room clearly is. But what I want to wrap up with is the challenges of being Pakistani in America. This is no longer of, yes, we are ambassadors. But I like my ambassador, and I would leave the ambassadorship to her. I don't need to do it all the time. Part of the issue is we are more than ambassadors for Pakistan. We are citizens in this community. There are problems happening here around us. And when something happens in Pakistan, it's not simply how we can influence that. That influences us. When someone makes a stupid statement about Halloween or Valentine's Day, all day in university, you have to hear these things about what is happening in Pakistan. That is what young people are thinking about, and they should be. So it is a two-way street. I would say the challenges of being Pakistani in America are particularly important at this time, and there are three important types of challenges. First of it is a political challenge. The political challenge used to be the politics of US and Pakistan. Thanks to Mr. Trump, it is now the politics of the US. <laughs> Now it is the, the, the politics of being Khizr Khan's son. Now it is the politics of what the US thinks about immigrants. Pakistani becomes in some ways subservient to that local politics. We need to understand that what worries people in the Pakistani American community is not just the Pakistani part of it, but also the American part of it. Right? And that's the important. So one set of challenges is that. The second cha set of challenges is the one I've been alluding to, which is the generational challenge. That half of your community is now born in this country. So how we think of the community has to change. They really don't get as excited about eating Nihari <laughs> as their parents did. Right? Some, some of them did. But we, we who have been here longer, I think, need to respond to that. That's what I mean. And the third set of challenges is identity challenge. Right? And the identity challenge is, who are we? And you have to think about an immigrant community as having multiple identities. Yes, we are Pakistani, but yes, we are Americans. Yes, we are Muslims, but yes, we are Punjabi. And how can identity be a strength 
for our young rather than a burden where a lot of those identities unfortunately come with a negative public perception. It is very, very difficult. Anyone here who's ever been 16 knows how difficult it is to be 16. But to be a Pakistani and a Muslim and 16 is one of the most difficult things you can be in this country at this point today. So a round of applause for all the young people at the back. It is, not, it is not easy to be young, ever. And it is especially not easy to be young being a Pakistani Muslim at this point. That is why they need your support. They don't need your followership, they need your support. So, what does this mean? As I said, I want to wrap up with these five ideas. What, what can we do? Uh, I, would, I, I don't know what we could do. You need to tell me what you would do. But I do have five uh, lessons that we can learn from other communities, including Pakistani communities elsewhere in the world. Uh, and I'll talk a bit about politics uh, in, in a minute. I, I, I don't want to, uh, 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 what was said earlier was very important. Politics is very, very important. People should involve themselves in politics, but not just as Pakistanis. Uh, which country outside Pakistan has the highest representation of Pakistanis origin people in their parliament? Anyone else? India, <laughs> Norway, Norway, because the largest immigrant community in Norway is Pakistan. But if you th if you look at, there are 14 parliamentarians in Norway of Pakistani origin. Nearly none of them talk anything about Pakistan because they are elected by their own communities that have their own issues. Five lessons as I as I wrap up. Lesson number one. One's message can come from many, one message can come from many voices. This idea that we have all to be united is perfectly nice, but it's really not practical. And what I mean by that is, there's nothing wrong with having multiple organizations, there's nothing wrong with having multiple views, there's nothing wrong with some people being Republicans and some people being Democrats. <laughs> That's what community is like. This top-down idea that we keep having, that we all must come together and create one super organization that's going to solve everything, ain't going to happen. Ain't going to happen. But here is the problem. Here is the problem. You can still have one common message. There are communities, I would name them in the US, who have a lot of internal infighting, but when a national issue comes outside, they all seem to speak with one voice. We seem to be the opposite. Internally, gale mil gale mil. as soon as someone else is talking, let me tell you what is wrong about this other guy. Right? And that's, that's the change that has to happen. Second message that we can learn from other communities that have done better is that diversity is strength, not a weakness. There is no, there is no one single way to be a good Pakistani. The only way to be a bad Pakistani is to believe that there is only one single way to be a good Pakistani. And, and we need to understand in all, all of this. This is a very difficult lesson for parents, right? Because we all want our kids to be what we want them to be. But that's, that's the strength, that's the lesson we learn from other communities. Lesson number three, community comes first. Community comes first. What does that mean? All politics is local. You, here is where I hope I don't sound like disagreeing because I don't think I am. I'm just trying to nuance it. You don't run for Congress to represent Pakistanis. You run for Congress to represent your district. If you run simply to represent your sub-community, there is no math in the world by which you can win. And the best example of that is the, actually the current mayor of, of uh, London, Sadiq Khan. Yeah. He has to be the mayor of London yeah. before he is a Pakistani. Once he is the mayor of London, his Pakistaniness might come out. And that means being integrated in all of your community, not just your sub-community. Uh, four, our young are our future.
and I already pointed out 50%, 50%. And finally, finally, so I won't go into this, and finally, and this is extremely, extremely important, uh, the last is, if you stand with others, others will stand with you. Please, please uh, take a moment, take a moment. Let, let me be, I hope I'm amongst friends. I hope I'm amongst friends. Imagine, imagine that Donald Trump had said nothing against Muslims. Imagine that Donald Trump had said nothing against Muslims. He had only praised them in the election. But he had still said the things about Mexicans and the war. Would we be for him or against him? Don't give me an answer. Just think about it. Don't give me an answer. And that is the question. If you do not stand up when someone else is being treated badly, then please do not expect them to stand up when you are going to be treated. And that, I think, is the first and most important rule of building a community. Thank you very much for being such a wonderful community.